ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Uncaged Season 3, Episode 2. My name is Mike Larkin, and no, we are not talking about the Separatist member again, because by my side is the one, the only, DC Daniel Crimmins. Daniel, how you doing today? We are doing fan freaking tastic We got ourselves a good show, not a bullshit pay-per-view that ended with ended in a big show losing. <laughs> He's still not forgiving me. He's no, still- and I won't. I won't. He's not. I tell you, he won't. Wait till we talk about what's going to be on episode three at the end of the show. We're New Yorkers. We, we don't forget. We don't. We don't okay. forgive. We don't forget. We don't forgive. I can't wait till I announce the episode three at the end of the show. But episode two <laughs> is a good one because also when the month of December, there is a there was a very somber death back in 2009. The death of the one and only Mr. Eddie Fatu, a.k.a. Umaga. And we're going to be talking about the life of a.k.a. Jamal. A.K.A. Jamal. We are going to be talking about the life and times of Umaga in this episode. We're going to talk about the three-minute warning run. We're going to talk about the Umaga run. And we're just going to talk about the legacy that he left on professional wrestling. Now, for me, we'll start like Daniel Daniel just said here. Three-minute warning. Now, I remember the first time I saw that D'Lo Brown and Sean Stasiak were having a match. And Eric Bischoff said, all right, impress me. See how it goes. I'll give you five minutes on the clock. I'll give you five minutes, right? And then they went down the clock and he goes, you know what? You're just boring me. And he gives him three minutes. There's down down to the clock. It's a boring match. And he goes, you know what? That's it. You guys are done. You know what? And then here comes Rosie and Jamal. They beat up D'Lo Brown and Sean Stasiak. They did not impress Mr. Bischoff. Eric Bischoff was bored. The fans are bored. So I want to ask you your initial incarnation of three-minute warning, Rosie and Jamal, when they came in and they mollywhopped D'Lo Brown and Sean Stasiak. Dude, I was all for it. Like, because you, you see these big, big Samoan guys. Like To me, it reminded me of the head shrinkers from back in the day. Yep. You know, Patu and Samu, the, the head shrinkers, like big, nasty guys, you know. And they could move like, like lightweights. And neither one of them was a light guy. No, they were both, what, like 350? Yeah, thereabouts. And I mean, you see Rosie doing a moonsault. Jamal's got that infamous snooker like splash. And I mean, they're beating up D'Lo and Sean Stasiak. I think the one that always gets you is where they beat up the fabulous Moolah and Mae Young. And they <laughs> they beat them down, man. Friggin' Moolah taking the splash and just the Samoan drop. Um, Lillian Garcia and ha- taking that. Poor Lillian taking that Samoan drop in the splash. The HLA girls <laughs> taking. Well, to be fair. Yes. There are the stories about Mae Young where she, you know, there's a classic story where it was when uh, Bubba was supposed to powerbomb her off the stage and she basically got in his face and said, look, you're going to do this and you're going to make it look good. And he did. Oh, he did. And like it was something different, like. And, you know, Rosie also got rest his soul, who. You know, the precursor to the tribal chief. Yes, yes, the Rome, the brother of Roman Reigns, the former SAIT, the superhero in training. That is, um, those two men, and what I liked about the powerful, powerful team. I mean, we saw them against Booker T and Goldust. We saw yeah. them in the mix for their one year run. But I mean, how can we not forget the fact that their first pay per view was against Billy and Chuck at Unforgiven 02, where the stipulation being if. Billy and Chuck lost that Stephanie McMahon would have to perform HLA at Unforgiven, which she didn't do. But I mean, they brought in a and Eric Bischoff's like, we got to bring in a bigger woman. And then it turns out that this bigger woman is Rikishi and it was a plan by Stephanie McMahon and Bischoff got stink face. So adding more of the Samoan tribal family, if you will, the tribal chief, if you will, the Samoan <laughs> heritage and legacy to it. Now I got to ask you, man, this was amazing times and fun times, but also kind of very, now, if you look at it from 21 years later, controversial time, the ruthless aggression era. What were your thoughts on the three minute warning Billy and Chuck feud, the wedding where they beat up friggin' poor Stephanie and everything that led to that match? What were your thoughts? You know, I, I remember, you know, I could see something like that happening now, given the political climate and the social climate we see, you know, the country in. Yeah. And to me, it was publicity because I remember, like, do Billy and Chuck, like, it was everywhere like it was mm-hmm. on the news it was on you know articles and it's like you know wwe to feature a gay wedding and it's like you knew neither one of them was gay no but they had people believing it 
I think the first memory I have is they were on the Today Show, like you mentioned. Like it was all over the news. Yeah. I remember when I went into school. So I'm in elementary school and I'm in the cafeteria, right? One of the aides, the cafeteria aides that we used to have that used to watch the kids Mm -hmm. came up to me and she knew I was a wrestling fan. And she goes, did you hear they're doing a gay wedding with Billy and Chuck? Everybody's talking about it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's a big deal. And not knowing that they aren't actually gay, but they're just like, oh my God, this storyline has become so big because Billy gets down on one knee and, you know, Chuck uh, proposes to Billy and they're getting married. It's a friendship thing, but it's just like, it became this big thing. And I mean, even Glad got involved, right? We're not Glad, like really like not into it. Like Glad really went hard at WWE for this angle, right? Yeah. Like at first you're like, okay, this is like a thing. And then when, when we, after it turned out, it was like, oh, I can't have this. I'm... The same people that criticize the storyline will cheer the Attitude Era. Exactly, because everything was better in the Attitude Era, don't you know? And I just, I, I remember the whole thing, and, you know, like I think it was Billy was kind of like, wait, 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 wait a minute. Like, I don't I don't know about this. We're not gay. I, we have nothing against gay people, yep. And then even Chuck started is is like, are we doing this? What are we doing? And Rico Rico was like, Rico was like, come on, we talked about this. Let's go. And then you hear the pre the the pastor doing the whole whether it lasts fifteen years or whatever. And then he just ends up with, or whether it lasts three minutes. And then you hear the wait a minute, did I just hear myself say? three minutes and then you know rips off the makeup and it's bischoff and then three minute warning it was so good how they executed the entire thing and i mean everybody played an integral part yeah. and this, and this was the heel turn of rico um going from billy and chuck to rosie and jamal and i mean the unforgiven match um i have to say the match wasn't bad for their pay-per-view debut and getting the win doing the samoan drop and the splashes I mean, they hung with Billy and Chuck, Billy being the veteran, and Chuck was also very decent in size as well. What were your thoughts on Daddy ass. (laughs) Daddy ass, yes. Which, just as an aside, dude's like, is he in his 60s at this point? He's like mid-50s going, he's like mid-50s to early 60s. The fact that he's this age and he looks better than I ever will. I know, you're jealous. We're all jealous. We're all jealous, Daniel. We are. Because we wish that we could look like Daddy Ass. We wish that we could look like Billy Gunn. Hell, when he was doing the Voodoo Kin Mafia, he still looked freaking good, man. But it's wild that of all the people from DX, he's the only one that's still wrestling, and he looks good. He does. And I think, well, he's always said, like, every time that he got into the ring or every time when he got into wrestling, he wanted to not only do it to the best of his abilities, but he wanted to be in shape and he wanted to just keep going, which yeah. his work regimen is just insane. Dude, he and he keeps up and, like, He's still humble, which I respect. Yeah, me too. But humble, I got to say, man, you talk about eating a piece of humble pie. What were your thoughts on this Rosie and Jamal Billy and Chuck match from Unforgiven 02 and then them getting their big win in their pay-per-view debut? Honestly, I, I, I loved it. I think the problem they made was after this, they should have just kept on pushing them to the moon. Yes, because if I remember correctly, and I was there for this, and we both saw this together as well live and just seeing it at the same time and really looking back on it, man, we had the three-minute warning in Rico against Jeff Hardy and the Dudley's six-man tables match from Survivor Series, which was a good match, the infamous come on Jeff goddammit from Rico because Jeff was late to the spot. Um, What were your thoughts on how we go from Billy and Chuck to this big feud with the whole HLA thing and getting all that intertwined being Bischoff's heavies? to the six-man table match at the Survivor Series. You know, I think the problem here is Vince, it's been said that he would lose interest in somebody really quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think this was a prime example of that. You know, he, uh, to me, I I don't know, I always felt like three-minute warning could have been a lot more. You know, like... Put the tag titles on them, but it's like it, if I remember right, it wasn't too much longer after this that they they weren't around all that much longer. No, I remember they had a feud with Booker T and Goldust, and they had like a couple matches there. Goldberg was in the mix with them very briefly, um, and then Jamal got fired. Umaga got fired because he got into a bar fight and yeah. he got released. Oh, that's what it was. That's why they broke up because. And then Rosie would go be with uh, Rodney Mack. He was back in the Mack player with Thuggin' and Buggin' Productions very briefly, and then he would become 
the superhero in training, the SHIT with the hurricane. And then I mean, that, that first ridiculous gear, the Hamburglar, <laughs> the, the cut up T-shirt and the spandex. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but but for me, and, and before we even get to what happened with uh, Umaga after this run, what were your thoughts on, were you a fan of the six-man table match? Because I, I, I will hold it fondly because I was there live. But were, do you still – Do you still like Survivor me? Series 02 or is that Royal Rumble? No, it was Survivor Series 02. Was that the one where Devon ended up coming back as yep. Yep. And he regular Devon? And just like, no explanation. Just we're back. It's just like, a, oh, okay. Oh, hello, Devon. You're back. You're on Raw now. We made a trade. <laughs> yes. Uh, there was just no explanation. It was just like, oh, yeah. Devon. And then uh, Deacon Batista was left to uh, do all the offerings. Yes. He was. I first... whatever happened to that guy. I know, right? He was with Ric Flair after. I, the... I can't see him. I can't see him. <laughs> Yes, Batista then would go on to be with Ric Flair and then, of course, Evolution. You know, that was the infamous, you know, you know, he's the product of a stepchild. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, he was a product of a foster family. That was the infamous, whoo, you're the man. You're also a foster child. Now, later than that, big man, Batista. He was supposed to have like a backstory that he would say uh, he was a foster child taken in by a foster family. Woo! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that that Survivor Series match was where Devon came back out of nowhere. Oh, by the way, yeah, hey Devon, and then they won, and that was the infamous match where Jeff Hardy did the Swanton under Rosie off the balcony, much like Royal Rumble of two thousand. I mean, it was fine, but then, like we mentioned, they had some matches with Booker T and Goldust, the Goldberg stuff, and then Jamal gets fired for the bar fight, and then Jamal would resurface in a TNA ring as Ekmo, uh, getting involved in Sunny Siaki's casket match, and him and Sunny. Yes, and him and Sonny Siaki became a tag team. They wrestled America's Most Wanted. They wrestled Shark Boy and Mad Mikey, aka Crash Holly, rest in peace. And um, yeah, it was a short time, but he was there for like a good year. As I, I didn't see him because I didn't start watching TNA to like mid two thousand four. But he was I there. I watched it briefly. What, well, what were your thoughts on the ECMO character, him and Sonny Siaki? They put yeah. the two small guys together. Yeah. But you also have to remember, wasn't this around the time when TNA was like taking every WWE like cast off? Anybody, anybody they could get. It's like, oh, hey, we'll take you. Raven, come on over. Yes. ECMO, you come here too, sir. <laughs> hey, it gave Raven the world title. So That is true. That is very true. But uh, what were your thoughts on the name, though, ECMO? He was he went from Jamal to ECMO. Well, I know it's a play on his real name, Eki. Yes, and plan on Eddie and Eki, yep. So... And it worked. I mean, like I said, it was a short time, but it wasn't bad, but it was kind of like, you know... That was it for him there. And, I mean, he did some Japan work. And did you notice that everybody pretty much around this time with how the Japan scene was, they would either go to All Japan when they got released, New Japan 01. That was kind of like a big deal. Like, every release talent was pretty much going over to Japan. Yeah. And me, it kind of seems like we're starting to – we got that for a little bit in the late teens. Yeah. I mean, everybody has done Japan, you know. And of course, I can't remember what year it was when he finally came back. So the best thing was, and I think I've always said this about Jamal and Umaga, like they were originally supposed to put three minute warning back together. So Rosie, oh, really? yeah. Do, do you remember the story? No, I never heard this. So Rosie was feuding with Gregory Helms because remember the hurricane turned on Rosie and then he became Gregory Helms. So he beats Rosie in a match, and Rosie's taken off TV. So they were supposed to put Three Minute Warning back together. They did like a dark match, and you know, and did a couple dark matches together. But then they released Rosie. So then he became, it was his weight, wasn't it? Like, I believe it was his weight too, much like Rikishi. Yeah, like he wouldn't, he wouldn't get, he wouldn't he get his weight. Yes, and so then that's when they dropped that whole thing, and then that infamous night after WrestleMania 22, after Ric Flair. Oh, that's what it was, yeah. After Ric Flair took a superplex off a ladder for Matt Hardy, you crazy, crazy man, you. Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy. And then Ric Flair is cutting this promo, and then here we hear, Escuchame, everybody, listen, ha-ha, to me. My name is Ar No, it was Ara Los Toros, Escuchame, everybody, listen, ha-ha, to, ha -ha. to me, to me. And he did the, my name is Armando Alejandro Estrada. Yep. And he, he said some others. I, I can't remember. I used to have it memorized. 
He was like, why? Yeah. I don't know why. I, I just don't ask. <laughs> I was about to say, wait a minute. So he was like, yeah, we like the finer things in life. <laughs> and he was going at Ric Flair. Going and back. then he just said, said something about, I bring to you Ooh, my the God. Samoan bulldozer. Ooh, my God. And then you just hear this music and you see this this wild man with the face paint and the hair going and just destroying, molly whopping, as you call it. Yes. Daniel, using Rick my Hutt. word. You're using my word. Okay, so yes. Yeah. Umaga, molly whopping Ric Flair. He gives him like a torture rack, spinning rack, pancake, Albert style neck breaker. He does the friggin' running hip attack in the corner. And he, in his first instance, reincarnation back as Umaga, he beats the holy hell out of Ric Flair, beats him at Backlash 06 in his debut. Now, funny fact here, and I looked upon this. Do you know what Umaga actually means? Well, according to the Rock, it means shriveled up monkey penis. (laughs) Do you know what it actually means? No. So he got the name from, it's the same name of the final and most painful part of the Samoan tattooing process, meaning the end. Really? Yes, I had read that and I had noted it down because I wanted to tell you what that was because I did not know that myself. But yes, I, you remember the promo. I do. I do remember the promo because I did that to my mom. I used to go to my mom all the time and he would come on. Escucha me. Everybody listen. Ha ha. To me. To me. To me. He was good. Like, first of all, that dude can talk. I had no idea who he was. I didn't know he was a developmental guy at the time. And Armando, I, Armando Alejandro Estrada. And he... He's not he's not Hispanic. He's Cuban, right? He's no, he's Middle Eastern. Are you serious? Yeah. No. Okay. Fair enough. Um. So <laughs> that he Omaga comes out like Daniel mentioned, just crazy hair, the face paint. Now, when you first saw him, did you know that was him? Did did he look familiar to you? He did, but I couldn't place it. Yeah, me either. I was like, wait a minute. Like, why do I feel like I know this person? Then it comes and out. He so Armando is trying to, he's actually Palestinian. Palestinian, okay. Fair and his real name is Hazem Ali. Okay, fair enough. All right. But yeah, god dang, man, that presentation of just him and then him beating Ric Flair at you know Backlash 06. And then we have this feud where he's pretty much beating everybody, like undefeated right. wise. Like the next feud I think he had was all right, we're gonna talk about this. He had a feud with Eugene and like the legends and Hacksaw Jim Duggan. I think he wrestled Kamala too. Like, did you like the fact that we were going the route of he's going to kill everybody, including Eugene? I mean, it it worked for what it was. Yeah. But it's like, why are you wasting your time? To me, I and I still think this can work. Mm-hmm. I would go with the Rocky Four approach. I must the agree. Drago approach. Yes. You ha- you have this unstoppable monster that nobody can beat. Right. And you put them up against eventually you get them up to the world champion. But this is when I think you diverge from the Rocky path. You have him beat the world champion. We're going to get to that in a second here, but here's my thing. He goes from the Eugene feud, right? He's beating Triple H. He's beating Shawn Michaels. He's even beating Cena on Raw. And, like, he's killing everybody. And the big feud that he had after this was he feuded with Kane. Now, did you enjoy the Kane Umaga feud in the nope. latest? No. Okay, why? It was Kane. <laughs> Well, if you remember correctly, he just came off of one of your favorite fruits at this time, that being Kane against the imposter Kane, the one and only good brother, Luke Callis. Luke Festus. Festus. Festus, if you will. So Kane had come off that. He had come off the May 19th thing. And then they decided, hey, man, you're going to feud with Umaga because we got to have the big man slap meat, sort of, kind of. And Umaga and Kane had this feud for like a few months. And then Umaga would wind up winning and beating Kane. And then we get to the big one, <laughs> which. John Cena and Umaga from New Year's Revolution, they have a great match, Daniel. And then all of a sudden, John Cena's the roll up one, two, three shocks the world. He's the first person to beat Umaga. Because, ends, of course, he was. Ends the undefeated streak at New Year's Revolution. What were your thoughts before we get to the big one? What were your thoughts on that match and just having Cena be the one to defeat him? It was a mistake. Okay, go ahead. Should have been a world. Sh- Umaga should have won the world title. 
agreed because they had pushed him so hot for that months and months and nine to ten months, and then you get to see him lose to a roll up. It was supposed to be the fluke thing, which gets us to a lot of people said during John Cena's run here with the title, like this was probably one of his best matches during that title reign. Him and Umaga, last man standing, crushes his spleen through the table, the announced table spot. I love that match. That was one of my favorite matches in Royal Rumble history. Cena's just still lost. Uh, agreed, but I, I mean, the story of it, I mean, you knew they were going to go Cena and HBK. And I mean, for you, were you a fan of just, I always had said this about Umaga and Cena, great chemistry, but yeah. also at the same time, man, like he was the perfect catalyst to John Cena. And I agree he should have won, but we still gave us moments and memories because then that would lead us to the Battle of the Billionaires. Bobby Lashley and Umanga, Umaga at WrestleMania. Umanga. Umanga. WrestleMania 23. Donald Trump. Samoan guy, funny hair. <laughs> you mean Umaga? <laughs> yeah, Umanga. So by Donald Trump and Bobby Lashley's corner. Didn't even know his name. My man, Bobby. You go get him, Bobby. And Umaga had Vince and Shane. And there's the infamous spot where Shane does the coast to coast drop kick to Bobby Lashley during the match. Uh, Donald Trump attacks Vince. Stone Cold Steve Austin's a special guest referee. Bobby Lashley wins. They hold Vince down. Shane's head. Trump yeah. tackles Vince. <laughs> most yeah. horrible. The most horrible tackle. That, that, they're punching him like this. Now, Trump, to his credit, didn't want to do any of that. Yes, he did. And say it that. took Vince being like, come, come, come on. You, come on, hit me, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Wait, now, hold on. I will say, Trump now? Yeah. Oh, I think he'd gladly do it. He'd be like, he'd be like okay. Oh, agreed. I mean, first of all, who's the worst uh, taker of the stunner, Donald Trump or Linda McMahon? I'm still saying Linda McMahon. Yeah. I mean, Trump took a bad stunner, but it ain't on Linda McMahon. Now, to be fair, Trump was not around wrestling. You know, no. and I, I love the story that, like, the Trump's advisors did not want him doing it at all. Which is hilarious. Because- and, but I guess... The story go, and I guess Austin would tell us the story occasionally that Trump went to Vince and says, "Do you think it would help the show if, if we did this?" And Vince said, "Absolutely, I think it would. I think it would really add to it." And he says, "I'll do it." So, kudos to him. Oh, absolutely, man. And I mean, it gave us a very memorable WrestleMania moment as it did. And then Umaga would be involved with the McMahons and the feud with Bobby Lashley for the ECW championship, which I'm going to say one moment before we get to this title run and do rag Vince. Um, the, the infamous spot on where they have the cage match on ECW, right? What were your thoughts on Bobby Lashley just diving into that cage and it lands right on Umaga? Like that was a sick spot, man. Yeah. And you then, know, like, that could not have felt good. Oh yeah, he that landed right on top of him, which was oof. I mean, even even from Lashley, because you got to figure, cage collapses and he's rolling down it, and that's steel. Agreed, and I think a man of his size just doing that just showed just how just friggin' freakish athletic he is, and Umaga just willing to take that punishment. And then he gets involved with the McMahons, man. Backlash 07, the uh, handicap match for the ECW title. They Bobby Lashley takes all this punishment. Vince gets the pin. Do rag Vince as your ECW champion. <laughs> and then the whole thing with Sabu. Uh, hey, fellas, look, it's a member of the Taliban. <laughs> that is something that, dude, you know, that would, like, oh my God. Oh. So they would get in so much trouble for that now. Oh, now it would be just, no. Oh, that would just be no. Um, my thing, too, is as well as we have the feud with Umaga just being involved with the McMahons and stuff. And then Bobby Lashley finally winning back the ECW championship from Vince McMahon and then immediately dropping it because he gets drafted to Raw. And, and then, then we end up with, I think, it was was it Mark Henry? Mark Henry was in 2008. That This was the um, the tournament where Johnny Nitro beat CM Punk because it was originally supposed to be that guy. Oh, the guy we don't we don't name. The guy we don't name, yes. But I mean, Umaga around this time too is really clean in house with the fact of well, he went from. I mean, let's let's be honest here, man. Like he wins the Intercontinental Championship from Jeff Hardy, his first title, like that year, right? Mm-hmm. Then he loses it to Santino Morella. Now I want to ask you about this because I know we're all over the place, but Santino Morella coming out in Italy, 
thanks to Bobby Lashley beating Umaga for the Intercontinental Championship. What was your thought on that moment? A quote unquote fan coming out of the audience and winning the Intercontinental Championship. I mean, there's something different, but I mean, people that, you know, follow the internet message boards already knew who he was. Yep. And for those of you that are questioning maybe what am I talking about? This was right around the time with the boogeyman. They were playing around with him in eight in um OV was OVW, right? Oh, yeah. And you know, Boogeyman was not supposed to be this joke of a character. He was supposed to be like a, a heel monster kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And he so he comes out and there's this wrestler that's in the crowd because that's what they did they tested it among you know the wrestlers the wrestler sees boogeyman and just starts laughing and he's smiling because and, and jim Cornette comes up and starts beating him with the tennis racket just slapping him with his hand goddamn son of a bitch you're gonna tell me you're not gonna fucking sell for the boogeyman you fucker and that guy was santino marala and well, he said Santino always tells the story. It's you know, I'm just I'm just sitting there with my daughter. You know, I was trying to scare my daughter, which his daughter Ariana Grace is now in NXT. Um, like it was just like some like he was trying to have a fun moment, and Jim Cornette's like, "What the fuck? You're not going to sell for the goddamn boogeyman, you son of a bitch!" But I also think that Jim Cornette also was pissed at the time too because he wanted to get the fuck out of WWE. He also had a thing earlier on with Kevin Thorne, aka Mordecai. And everybody that was there in OVW. So, I mean, he was on his edge. And he was looking to get out of there in 05. And that was it because he slapped Santino Morella. And then the office canned him. And then well, he was Boris Alexiev at the time, Santino. Which he was playing a Russian character, but he's Canadian. As it was with being Italian. He's got the Italian in him, but he's Canadian. So, I mean, they did that. And then him and Umaga had the feud where Umaga beat him for the Intercontinental title. Again, for the second run. And this is where, in our story here, Daniel, we get to... Babyface Umaga. Yeah. I honestly think that could have been a thing. (laughs) So John Cena is getting beaten down by Randy Orton and Carlito. And Umaga says, you know what? Fuck this. I'm I'm, screw you guys. I'm going to help John Cena. And because, you know, him and John Cena are best buddies all of a sudden. And then he beats the crap out of Randy Orton and Carlito. And I'm like, they turned him babyface. I was there at the SummerSlam in 07 where he beat Carlito and Mr. Kennedy in a triple threat. And I'm like, it was a short run because then afterwards he would lose the title to Jeff Hardy because I think this was when Umaga was a part of that pharmacy thing, the 30 day, you know? Oh yeah. I remember. Yeah. And, um, because of that, that, guy. Of that guy. Yeah. But what were your thoughts on babyface Umaga and his intercontinental title run? Honestly, I feel like it could have been more. Do you, could you see him? Like we were talking about him being more of a baby face, but with that character and how it was presented, could you be seeing the Samoan bulldozer as a baby face? Yeah. I mean, I would not have him talk, and we'll get to him talking towards the end of his run, but I mean, that is someone with such athleticism and prowess, like you can make like a top baby face, but the right afterwards, he went back to being heel. He wrestled Triple H in that match at No Mercy for the WWE Championship where Triple H wrestled Randy Orton, Umaga, and <laughs> and friggin' one night because John Cena had to friggin' tear his peck in that match with Mr. Kennedy, and then John Cena was gone till the Royal Rumble 08. Uh, what were your thoughts on Umaga being involved in the WWE Championship scene? Again, you would have had an opportunity to upset the Apple Card and have him win, but not again. Vince plays it safe and just gives it right back to Randy Orton. That was my thing too. Like he had a couple shots at the title in 07. I mean, John Cena defend against him and Kali on Raw. I mean, there were there were so many opportunities to give him. I felt he was more than Intercontinental Championship material, so to speak. Right, and I mean. Yeah. Maybe if things had been different, he would have. If he didn't have the substance issues, maybe something would have been different. I mean, for me, as we're moving along the timeline, Daniel, like we get to 08. Like, if you remember, he really didn't do yeah. much at the beginning of 08. And the big thing that they did was another interpromotional match at WrestleMania 24, which it's kind of become forgotten that a lot it's done. Like, him and Batista had a Raw vs. SmackDown match, which Batista won. What were your thoughts on the fact that we went to. Umaga and Batista for WrestleMania because really didn't have much for Umaga or Batista. Yeah. What were your thoughts on the interpromotional match? You know, it was Batista, he, company guy. They're going to give him whatever he wants. That's my thing, too. And, and I hate to even say this about like the run here. Like for me, as, as we're really looking back at it, like it started off hot, like with him going through everybody in 06 to 07, the Cena feud. And then he kind of just like 
you know, after Bobby Lashley and Umaga at the WrestleMania 23 and the McMahon stuff, he kind of just went down and everything, you know what I'm saying? And then we get to 08 and it's him and Batista. But there was some rejuvenation here because the Jeff Hardy feud happened. Like he's wrestling Jeff Hardy at, you know, and the cage match, you know what I'm saying? When Randy Orton was going against Jeff Hardy, he's wrestling him at Judgment Day, the infamous one night stand falls count anywhere match where Jeff does the swanton off the truck. What were your thoughts on him really getting back in there with Jeff Hardy? Because him and Jeff Hardy have had matches in their Continental Championship. There's history there. So what were your thoughts on the Jeff Hardy feud? Honestly, what I would have done differently is I would have had Yamanga, which yeah. I will he's always gonna be Yamanga to me. Okay. I would have had Umaga turn face yeah. right after the whole after Vince lost the ECW title, which I still don't like saying that because it's like should have never been ECW champion. Right. And so I would have had Vince go I would have had, you know. Lashley, I, I would have had, you know, Vince holding Lashley, Maga goes for the Samoan spike, and Lashley gets out of the way, he hits Vince, Lashley pins Vince, one, two, three, and then it's, remember when Big Show turned heel, or turned face the first time? Yes. I would have done that, but with Umaga, where Umaga turns face, hits Vince with the Samoan spike, and, you know, you have him as a baby face. And just as some guy that, you know, comes out to help the faces. I like that. You know, just the impulsible force, the irresistible force, the movable object deal. And I mean, like I was saying, like the best thing about 08 for me was the Jeff Hardy run. And I mean, for him, did you feel like, I mean, we talked about the three and a warning thing back in 02 with Jeff. Did you like the fact that we got to see more of like the high flyer, the underdog against Umaga, you know, throwing caution to the wind? I think those two always had great chemistry. And I think that's really a big feud for him. And then... Yeah, man. And then you know the thing about it is sometimes contrasting styles can either work or not work. This worked absolutely. And I mean, for me, like I'm, as I'm looking back at Umaga's run, like towards the end of 08, like he was just used like sporadically. But I think what hurt him is I remember he, I think he tore his PCL. He had an injury, I believe it was a leg injury. Yeah, I think so. And then we didn't see him for the rest of 08. And pretty much the best thing I can say about this is they did some great vignettes, like hyping him back up, and he was coming to SmackDown. And then we get to 09, which his first view back is with CM Punk. And he beats him on pay-per-view. And then he has the match with Punk in the strap match, which would be his final match in WWE, which Punk won. But what were your thoughts on, they built him back with this, you know, with the vignettes. And then he goes into a program with CM Punk. What were your thoughts on the CM Punk feud? Didn't work. It was a dud. I mean, for me, why did you have him try to talk? You think you're hurt. Well, you're going to be even more hurt when we're going to have a Samoan strap match. Like, why did you even have him talk? See, uh, this was at a point where they could have put him with somebody. Anybody. Mm -hmm. Somebody that can talk. Right. You know, you you, you could have used literally anybody. But no. And that's what I'm saying, man. Like he he does that, and unfortunately, his substance abuse uh, would lead to his release from the WWE. Now, I want to ask you now before we even found out about the substance abuse and what happened when you heard that Umaga got released. What was your initial reaction? You know, I was kind of surprised because it's like he was like one of Vince's guys. You know. Now, if I remember correctly, like one of the integral parts that they were going to have him do is there was rumors that he was going to feud with The Undertaker that year, which Umaga and The Undertaker would have been really, really good. Yeah. But and I was shocked, too. And then all of a sudden, you know, we hear about what's going on here. He's doing some independence. I know he did a match for Carlos Colon's promotion against Mr. Anderson, who had also gotten fired because he back he did a back suplex onto Randy Orton's head. And Randy Orton was not happy about that. <laughs> The and immediately demanded he be fired, and Vince said, "Okay, Randy. Okay, Randy. Whatever you say, Randy." And then he fired, <laughs> he fired Mr. Anderson, and then your favorite comes into fruition here, Mr. Daniel Crimmins. He he goes into the Hulk Hogan Australia tour, baby. He's on that tour, and it's him against Mr. Anderson. It's him against Brutus the Barber Beefcake. It's him and Orlando Jordan against Mr. Anderson and Brutus the Barber Beefcake. What were your thoughts on you here? Umaga's going on the Hulk Hogan Australia tour, which a lot of those guys would go into TNA in 2010, which started the Hogan era there. What were your thoughts on that? Seeing him in that. 
<laughs> Come on, say it. Come on, no. say it. Come on. No he heat. On, he was on the Australia tour. I mean, he was on the Hulk Hogan Australia tour. I don't know why Hulkamania was doing Australia tour, but they were doing it. He wrestled Brutus Beefcake. He wrestled the Booty Man. He wrestled the Booty Man. The Zodiac. The Zodiac. Come on, Daniel. Brother Brutai. The Disciple. The Disciple. <laughs> The and any of his other litany of fucking horrible gimmicks. The disciple. I forgot about that one. Okay. But, like, and here's my thing. And before we even talk about his death and his legacy, the rumor was, like I mentioned, the rumor of putting three-minute warning back. Do you remember what the rumor was at the time before? No. Died? So it was originally agreed upon that he was going to return to the WWE and he was going to be in the Royal Rumble in 2010. He was on his way back to WWE, which is even sadder to think about. And I mean, Chris Jericho recently said in an interview and on his podcast that when he fired Umaga, Vince McMahon was like, you know, I didn't want to do it, but I, I had to do it. You know what I'm saying? He wouldn't because get help. He wouldn't get help. And then we find out on December 4th that Umaga at the age of 36 passes away, has a heart attack. Um, it, it, that that hurt me, man. For me as a wrestling fan, just seeing what he'd done for his tenure there. And then, you know, he got released and you're thinking, okay, he's going to do the tour. Maybe we'll hope to see him back. And then this happens and too young. You know, the, the sad thing is, is, you know, as we get older, it's like, and I, and I was thinking about this with, with Bray Wyatt. is like, Bray was younger than me. Yeah, he was in his I'm room. older than than. Eki Fatu was, you know, and the, the the truly tragic part of, about both of them, and, you know, Eki especially, we don't know what could have been. That's the thing too, man. And I mean, when you just have a heart attack, I believe at the time they said like they found it was bleeding out the nose. He had a heart attack. I mean, for someone his size, his stature, it's crazy. But it's it's. I always say this, man. It's always the good ones that not only die young, but you all you hear this in wrestling. It's too much of just substance pills and just everything that goes into it that they put on their body. Yeah. And now the story is the one story is that Jimmy and Jay Uso, which I think was Josh, who was Jay, and yes, Jimmy, who's John, yes, so Jimmy John, <laughs> Jimmy John, <laughs> that's God. Um. Yeah. We're kind of, you know, floundering in, in, in what they were doing. And I guess uh, Umaga drove from Texas to F Florida, I think. They were living in Florida at the time. Yep. And I guess he said to him, look, come with me now. And, you know, do this thing or I'm not helping you again. Like, this is it. You know, yeah, we're thing. going now. Yeah, they talked about it in the WWE 24 where, like, he was the one that helped the Usos get into developmental. Like, you know, if you guys are serious about this, well, let's do this now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I mean... Like, no wishy-washy. No wishy-washy. And now we see Yeet and no Yeet doing their thing, solo and tag. And if you notice, yeah. you see it more with Jay. Look at Jay's ring gear closely. It's very Umaga-esque. It's, you know, he has like the the palm tree on the side, much like his dad wore back in the head shrinkers, much like, like Yamanga wore. And of course, the guy who I affectionately refer to as Solo Maga. Solo is this generation to Maga. He does the spray. Tries to be. Tries oh, to be. Hold on, man. All right, we're going we're gonna to get into this because I like Solo Sokoa and I know you. I do, do too. But All right. Good. He should be his own fucking person, not a carbon copy of manga. Well, if well, if you look at his finishing move, the swinging solo, that's Yokozuna's move. That's spinning your night. He does Yokozuna's move, and he does a, a spike. Move. Yes, yes. It's like not a bad he, fight. He moves like Umaga. He he does the screaming like Yamanga. He does the headbutt in the corner like Yamanga. But yet, we have Jay as the one who does a running butt splash into the corner. And he does the splash like Umaga does, yes. <laughs> no yeet. No yeet. <laughs> but I, I, I dig it. And I mean, when you when you look at someone like Umaga, I've always said this. He's someone that is never going to be forgotten. No. He's, he's one of those guys for me, man. Should have been a world champion. 
uh, Intercontinental Champion, did his thing. Twice. 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 Like Becky Lynch, twice. Uh, did his thing. Had a lot of memorable moments, I got to say. For the three years that he was there, great moments. And I would have loved to see him come back in 2010. I think he would have done very oh. well. You know, you think of gr- the great Samoan wrestlers, at least of our time. You know, we had guys like Yoko Zuna, guys like Rikishi. You know, you had Eki slash Yamanga slash Jamal. We have the Usos, which just as an aside, I I think it's clear Jimmy is the one who's got it. Yeah. You know, I, I think he's your more bankable star. And to think of what could have been if, you know, he had lived. You know, maybe they would have brought him in on this, you know, tribal chief stuff. I think he most certainly would have been involved with Rikishi and the Wild Smoans, yes. And now the question is, like, do you put him in the Hall of Fame? I would say yes. I mean, if Rikishi's in there, I would put him in too. If you can have Drew Carey, (laughs) and I'm going to say it, politics aside, right? Donald Trump is in the Hall of Fame. Yes, he is in the celebrity wing. That's correct. The, the, that you even have a celebrity wing in the Hall of Fame. The only person that should be in the celebrity wing is goddamn Ozzy Osbourne because if there's a Hall of Fame, put Ozzy in it. All right, my two that baseball, should... basketball, football, Ozzy's <laughs> in it. I don't care. <laughs> I think for me, the two people that I think should be in the celebrity wing that are not is uh, Regis Philbin and Cindy Lauper. What about Lawrence Taylor? Getting well, he should just be in there because Bam Bam Bigelow saved his ass like two minutes into that WrestleMania 11 match because he got blown up. He was gassed in like a minute. <laughs> it was so bad. Go back and watch that main event, folks. Lawrence Taylor and Bam Bam Bigelow. Lawrence Taylor gets gassed first minute in. Like I don't know if he was. I know he had some substance stuff as well. Yeah, I think he was on the roids. But dude, it was obvious. Like. And you know Bam Bam is probably thinking, like, I better fucking be getting paid for this. <laughs> we'll be in the main event of WrestleMania and carrying this jamoke. Yes. And yes. we also had uh, a man who would go on to become WCW United States champion, Steve Mongo McMichael, also there. Yeah. Okay. Yes. No. All right. Yeah. Mongo. The good old Mongo. Um, Man, you know, thinking about it, too, like, you think it got, with three minute warning possibly in the tag team champions? Like I would have loved to seen that too. I would have seen a what of a lot the trajectory would have gone because I think they've had, could have had some great matches in two thousand three with the Dudleys uh, for those. Or tag even teams. beyond that, like I think Cade and Mur- eventually Cade and Murdoch versus three minute warning. I mean, we kind of well, we got Cade and Murdoch against Rosie in the Hurricane, but that's not the same. That's not the same. But like the heavy hitting style, like. I, I, dude, I don't know. Like to me, Trevor Murdoch is is like a Stan Hansen type. Very much like he has that look. He's Dick Murdoch Jr. He's Waxahachie, Texas. He's go ready. He's ready to kick your ass. Former NWA champion, Trevor Murdoch. Twice. Twice. But yeah, no, it's just I, I smile every time I think of Umaga because he's one of the good ones. He like he literally was one of the good ones. And now I look at his son. Uh, was it Zalifa Fatu? Yeah. Okay. He he looks great. I think he's going to be a big star. There's rumors that you know he may be you know going to AEW, mm-hmm. which you know okay. But to me, I, I think, and don't get me wrong, you know I, I like some of what AEW does, but I, I feel like as far as like the Samoan thing, like WWE would know more what to do with him. I mean, Solo almost went to AEW when Cody was there because Cody was looking at him highly and he wanted to bring him in, but then Solo went to the WWE. Your boy is like, no, nah, not today, player. Not today, player. <laughs> you go to AEW, you're going to go one-on-one with the Undertaker. <laughs> did you hear, Ted, speaking of that, did you hear Teddy Long's story very briefly as an aside on my end? Did you hear what Teddy Long said? No. Someone said to Teddy Long, that um, you know, AEW is not hiring any old people, and he's like, like I would want to go there. Like I'm looking for a job. Apparently, someone told Teddy Long that AEW is not hiring old people, and Teddy's like, like I, I like I'm not looking for a job. Like why would you tell me that? But okay, 
Like, dude, Teddy Long is arguably one of the greatest wrestling personalities. Yes. Let me holla at you, playa. Like, the, the freaking... Holla, 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 holla. The manager of the skyscrapers. Like, come on now, man. On. And not only that, but, like, the whole one-on-one with the... Undertaker. The only fact one. is he... It got turned into a meme, and he has leaned into that. Like it's it's just something that is just caught on, and I mean you you see a lot of things that come on. Like I mean, like one of the also the subtleties, intricacies, and nuances, and we'll mention Amaga here. I used to love before he would hit the Samoan spike when Armando would break the cigar and he would like tell Amaga to hit the spike. Like I love that. Yeah, that's the thing, man. It's just it has those little layers and nuances to the character, and I mean if you if you really think about it, man, like. We had so many great Samoan talents. Like yeah. he should be in the Hall of Fame. Rosie was another one that died too young. You know what I'm saying? Now both of them are just kicking some butt in heaven and doing. The they tried. Thing. You know, it's it, it said that, and Jer- like you mentioned the the interview with Jericho, he said that Vince was on. I think he said they were doing tribute to the troops. It was Afghanistan, and yeah, the one said that, like, and Vin and. I think this was right after Umaga had passed. Yes, I think the chair. Was- okay. He said that like he was sitting down with Vince, and he said Vince was almost in tears. He said, "I tried. I tried to help him, but he wouldn't." You, you know, people say what they will about Vince, but I, I genuinely believe that. Like when you see these people going in for the rehab and WWE office and rehab, y- they do try. Y- you got to give them that. They do try. It's a look at Scott Hall alone. Scott Hall has had so many, God rest his soul, has there, had so many chances. There was an interview, I think it was with Stephanie. That, that they were asking her about you know the wellness in Scott Hall, and she said, "I said, well, how much have you spent on rehab? On you know, with with for him, and you know, she she said, I, I don't know an exact figure, honestly. And they said, well, is it within? The, is it in the tens of thousands? She said, oh no, it's more than that." And they said ten, hundreds of thousands, and she says, "Yeah, that's that's a, that's a, say, I would say that's getting closer." In a way that kind of makes me mad, and you know why? Because I think of that goddamn, and thank God she's in jail. That goddamn Tammy Sitch. An interview said like they like you know I was going to rehab, and they used all the money to spend on Scott Hall. He's like, "But you'll help Scott Hall, but you won't help me." And I'm like, "Hello, Tammy." Like <laughs> you have to ask for help. Well, exactly. Like hello, Tammy. <laughs> You have to actually want the help and not cry like you do with your. Scott enemy. Hall tried. He did. She did not. You know, and don't get me wrong. I try not to judge. I would. Yeah. But sometimes taking a step away is what's needed. I think a lot of them, when they're in the limelight, like they are, including and I'll include Umaga in this. Like he was, he was featured in a lot of big roles in that company. Like you're constantly in the limelight. I mean, sometimes you need to take a step back and get your stuff yeah. together. Like you need it. Like, <sighs> look at Zach Gowan. Oh, you know, yeah. dude was in in WWE for a hot cup of coffee. I think it was a mixture of he was young, he had a little bit of an attitude, he was a little full of himself, and I just think he, you know, he needed to be humbled, if you will. Without the Iron Sheik. Without the Iron Sheik, yes. He needed to be humble. The rest of soul. Rest of soul. Oh, but that's the thing, man. It's just, it's, it's it's crazy to think of just like, and a lot of people say it about professional wrestling, and we see it a lot. I mean, you'll especially see it in the Iron Claw movie with um, Zac Efron and MJF. Which I'm it. looking forward to. Me too. Like the story of the Von Erichs. Like, look at what the Von Erichs had to go through. They went through a lot. And I mean, Kevin's the only one left with his sons. And how sad is it for him? Like... His brothers should be alive to see this. I know. It's got to be. Harry Von Eric, former Intercontinental Champion. Yep, Texas Tornado. And it's sad, which I actually, I think think that movie opens pretty soon. Yep, tomorrow as we're recording this. Which, from what I've heard, I've heard good things. I've heard Zach Efron has even said he is open to working a match. 
Well, I think he found out really quickly because Chavo Guerrero worked with him on that movie. I think he's just like, oh, so it's like this and like that because Zac Efron's mindset was just like, you know, moves. Okay, you want me to do moves? And he's like, no, 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 no. It's, it's how you get to the moves. It's the story. So he got to learn psychology and what it's really about. And, I mean, he's an actor, and he knows it's a performance. So Zac Efron kind of went on really quickly. He's got to finish the story. <sighs> that he does. And I think – Okay, we did that. We did go back to uh, uncaged the uh, finale of season two, talking about well, Corey Cody Rhodes. It's, it, it's the tragic thing about this is just knowing what could have been. Agreed, and I think when you think of the Samoan legacy and the Samoan lineage, you think Umaga, you think of the Samoan Spike, you think of the Samoan Bulldozer, you just think of a guy with a heart of gold, uh, someone who is so athletic, such a prowess, and just someone who's truly going to be missed. I look at it like the small legacy and the dynasty you they've called it the Anawaii dynasty yep to me it's a ladder you know everybody like you know you had high chief peter maivia you had afa and sika and you know the tonga kid you had all these great samoan icons all getting to the end goal and we are at that end goal agreed with everything with that roman we- reigns Oh, yeah. You know, I, mean, he, I know Roman is one of the most divisive figures in wrestling. You know, it took a while, but they found what worked for him. I mean, we went from the big dog to the tribal chief, and this is his best. <laughs> Suffering Succotash. <laughs> Suffering Succotash. So what we have now is just incredible. The last three exactly. years. Have been, yeah. And think when Roman... At probably honestly, realistically, it's probably gonna be WrestleMania 40. Yeah. When the shoulders are down one, two, three, and you're thinking he's gonna kick out three. And it's whoever. And really, it could be doesn't matter. It's probably gonna be Cody, but really realistically, let's say it could be anybody. The crowd reaction alone. I think that's what people don't take into account is just the fact that you're looking for that moment where Roman Reigns, you know, say what you will about him not being around and defending the title as much like it's the 80s. It doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be. And people don't understand, like, he's that mystique. He's that aura. When he comes back, people are going to be putting up the ones. People are still It was the same thing with Brock. When Brock had that title, you were cheering for somebody, anybody to take it off of him. Yeah, because he was the part-time guy, and you you were tired of Brock. I mean, do I think Roman's got very long left after he loses it? No, because honestly, what's left for him to do? And the man, for what he's put his body through and just being around for all this time, he needs a break. He needs to take some time off. You know what I'm saying? Go, Go to Hollywood. Make your movies. Like... Catching on your looks while well, you still got him, Roman. <laughs> yes. That's the thing, man. It's just that's what wrestling and everything's all about. It's the performance. It's the representation of your presentation. And it's just about seeing the big picture of what it is to be a superstar. And I think that's the amazing part of the yeah. professional wrestling art. And, I mean, I think before we wrap a bow on Umaga here and just his whole legacy and rest in peace, you will truly be missed. And everything that goes into the Samoan family and dynasty. One other thing I did forget to mention as we looked at his career and the trajectory of what we would have done. One final thing I have to mention that we didn't mention because he was a part of another infamous moment. He beat the shit out of the jackass guys, including Steve-O. You son yeah. of a bitch, Steve-O laughing. <laughs> and they asked him, like, Steve-O even talked about it. He's like, they asked him about this. And they're like, well, are you sure you want to do this? And they're like, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll do it. Then it's like, oh, okay. Like, And they told Umaga. The jackass guys told Umaga, don't take it easy on us. Oh, <laughs> wrong, wrong one. Oh. So he beats the crap out of Chris Pontius, right? And then Steve O's laughing, and you can see Umaga getting visibly pissed because he's beating him up and he still is laughing at him because he's no selling. Like, dude, you're no selling the beat down. Umaga is telling you to stay the F down, and you ain't staying the F down. He splashed you, he Samoan spiked you. He slammed you. Like, you could tell he was getting visibly pissed because they were legit just no-selling what he was doing. And this is a guy who could legit hurt you. Yes. Like, he was literally looking at him without even saying. He's like, stay down. Stay down. 
there are certain wrestling families. You know, you got the Colognes, you got the Hearts, you got, you know, you mentioned the Von Erichs. You've got the Von Erichs, the Rhodes. The Anawaii family have to be up there as well. Oh, agreed. They're there. People the- that take their craft beyond serious. And people you don't want to fuck with. I mean, Roman has even got had to get a little stern with people. He gave Kevin Owens a black eye. Because Kevin got a little stiff with him. He did. He got him right in the friggin'. Well, okay, if someone hits you in your eardrum, you're going to be pissed too. And he was not supposed to do that. Kevin Owens got a little bit of that adrenaline rush and then whap, right into the eardrum. And I have no doubt there'd be something with that. And, and you know, it's, and I remember that. And it was, I remember shortly after he died, um, Armando Estrada did a, was that an indie show? And as a tribute to Maga, and the video's out there on YouTube somewhere. Um, they're playing Umaga's old theme, and you know, you know, Armando's you know he's tearing up. He's obviously a sad for his friend, but he does the intro one last time. I love and, it. I I wish we because I feel like a, a feud between those two could have been good. I mean, yeah, if you had Armando having managing another giant against Umaga would have been fun. I think or just so. Umaga, oh, Armando himself. He was not a bad wrestler. He really wasn't. Oh. Ah, the ECW GM run where he was feuding with Colin Delaney, who was supposed to be that version of Mikey Whipwreck. Yes, Armando. Oh, and then he oh, he wrestled the infamous knock knock. Who's there? Braden Walker. I'm gonna knock your face, knock your lights out. Knock, knock, who's our brain? Walker. I'm going to knock your brains out. I will say, just as an aside, I feel bad for Chris Harris that they are still doing that shit. <laughs> Friggin' 14 years later. Oh. Talk about bad creative. Oh, that is going to be a future episode of Uncaged, the bad creative of many <laughs> out there. The rise and fall of Braden Walker. We hardly knew that episode either. would be 10 minutes. <laughs> We hardly knew ye Braden Walker, but we do I know a name like Braden Walker. Like, who thought that was a good name? <laughs> I don't know. He went from Chris Harris to like his real name is Chris Harris, and you're like, we're gonna call you Braden Walker. I'm gonna knock your brains out. And you give him like this plain black thing, like black and white tr- and boots. He almost killed Armando Estrada with that cross body. He landed on his head. I will say, just as an aside. When he came back to TNA and they were doing that mess and knock, knock, who's it? James Storm could not keep a straight pass. He seemed just going, he's like. Sacrifice 2011, folks. Watch it back. But I will say the happy part about that is that they got to do AMW one last time. In, in, yeah. uh, in, yeah. That was at least a good thing. And, you know, it's t- to think, you know, to wrap a nice, put a nice little bow on this. Yeah. If we if it hadn't been for Umaga, we wouldn't have the Usos. You know, we wouldn't, you know, and to hear from people we we know him as being the monster. Mm-hmm. But to hear Roman talk about him, to hear Jimmy and Jay talk about him and Rikishi talk, because he was Rikishi's little brother, right? Yeah, he was Rikishi's brother. And to hear even Solo talk about him. He sound from I every mean, he sounds just like the nicest guy. Like he was a genuinely good man. And that's the sad part. And you know, if it wasn't for Umaga, you know what we wouldn't have? What's that? Yeet. Yeet. <laughs> and we wouldn't have you And we wouldn't have gotten the greatest press conference in WWE history. <laughs> do you feel him, sir? Do you do you feel him, sir? Do you feel him, sir? <laughs> But yes, we wouldn't have gotten you manga by William Regal and you manga, Bat- you manga, <laughs> big smelling guy. Funny hair. Yeah, you mean Umaga? Yeah, you manga. mean Umaga? Yes, yes, you manga. That's what I said. <laughs> but yes, no, he's he's one of those guys. Like I even remember one final story. I remember there was a house show, and Maria, I think, has mentioned this. Maria Canellas, right? Like somebody was trying to mess with her and Umaga got in his face and ran the guy off. Like, yeah, that, that's someone you really want to have, you know, you want to fuck with. That I guy. want to piss him off. 
No, that's the thing. It's just he was just a good guy. Or, good <laughs> good. Right. Do you remember it was a house show and there's pictures of it? He lost his gear. Okay. And there's a picture of him wearing Randy Orton trunks. I have to find this. Okay. This that does sound familiar. He was wearing like the Orton small trunks, right? Yes. Oh my Which, god. You, Orton, you know, very kind of slender guy. Umaga. Not so much. Big guy. Big guy. Not that big guy, but a big guy. Not, yeah. Like he's a he's he's like me, a little bit of fluffy. But thick. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on. Daniel Kirby, you called yourself a little bit of fluffy. That's what you are, sir. You're a little bit fluffy. I'm a little bit fluffy. A little bit fluffy. Okay. But yes. That's correct. You know, you're right about that. Now that you mentioned that. It was just well, I mean, it's looking at, at Umaga, I just. I think with a lot of these guys that pass on too soon is just. You wonder what could have been. Agreed. And I think what could have been was if he had gone back to WWE in 2010, which was the plan, I think we probably would have seen him maybe against The Undertaker. I think we probably would have seen him, if he's in the right spirits, going in the WWE title contention. And I think he would still be kicking ass and taking names like he does. And I mean, yeah. What if instead of Brock ending the streak, it was Umaga? That would have been interesting. Or here's an idea. Umaga versus Brock. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Two big, meaty guys just throwing down. I mean, we've gotten Brock and Rikishi on SmackDown, but, I mean, we've never gotten Brock and Umaga. I think that would be very interesting. And I think Umaga would hold his own. Difference, Brock and and, uh, Yamanga have two similar styles. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know. It's, it's just sad to think of what could have been. Agreed, man. And I think whoever he was in there with and whatever angle he was, he made the most of it. And we're still talking about him to this day. And he made his debut back in 06, his return to WWE in 06. And he made his WWE 20 years, ago. 20 years ago, man. It was 22 years since that debut of three minute warning. But you're, we will be missed, Umaga. And uh, thank you for all that you've done. And thank you just for the memories. Yamanga. Yeah, you manga. <laughs> Yay. Yay. So, Daniel Kermans, it was great to be really just talk and really express what we think about the great art yeah. of professional wrestling and umaga. But we're going to be up to episode three, folks. And when you hear this show, it'll be the new year. So, happy new year, everybody. Early on, just say hope, hope you all had a Merry Christmas and a happy new year. Um, yo, man, episode three. We're going to the Rumble season, Daniel Kermans, because January is Rumble season. It's one of my, honestly, one of my absolute favorite pay per views just because. I will tell you, Mike, the surprises. You know, you you never know. And it's some years have been better than others. I, I think this year we're going to get a couple. I think so, too. And we will I'm talk. making the prediction right here, right now. Yeah. I think Sasha Banks is coming back in the Women's Rumble. I think so, too. I think Mercedes Monet will be a nice little surprise. Sasha Banks, yes. I think she's coming back. Um you know, I, we're, we're going to see. I, I don't honestly, I don't really know who's. I I would not be shocked to see Matt Cardona come back. He has to just for that. I mean, if Chelsea Green was last year, we have to have Matt Cardona. I love just as an aside, he tells the story. I'm going to go off on a tangent. I say the interview he did with Chris Van Vliet. Yeah. Where he said the night that Chelsea Green won the women's tag titles, he buys a replica. Of the yeah. women's tag titles and wore it to the ring. Didn't even tell her he was doing it. He, just he did just, it. Yep. <laughs> it <was> so awesome. <laughs> I, I'm surprised WWE didn't tell me, like, uh, dude. What are you doing? No, none of that. No. No, I think it was just, it was so funny. It, 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 that That is like, it's like yeet. You know, you just go with it. It was just so funny. That was so awesome. Like, no, you just go with it. You go with stuff like that. But Because it, you know, it, got, it got eyes on Chelsea Green. It did. And I mean, she's just been kicking ass and taking names since she's been back. with. Us. She's done really well. She's done so much. But, you know, there's rumors that Deanna Perrazzo may be coming back. Well, 
it's under different management this time, and I think yeah. she'll have a great run in NXT or the main roster wherever she goes. I think it'll be better. You know, I think Deanna would do very well now in WWE. She made her name for herself in Impact. Um, and I guess, guess there's, she, her Impact contract is, is done. I've heard Steve Macklin, her fiance, is coming up too. That, that was previously in WWE. The forgot you mean the forgotten son, forgotten no more. Who? Who? The forgotten sons? Who? Oh boy. <laughs> I mean, we'll see. It's it's said that WWE wants to bring back a lot of the release talent. Mm-hmm. You know, I know they I know before Brave Pass, they really were trying to bring back Mike Bennett. And they're trying to get Taven back as well. You know, I think it, it's going to be very interesting to see who we do get. And I mean, man, Punk is going to be in the Rumble. You know, he's going to be in the Final Four. Yep. I'm excited, man. Yeah, he's probably going to be debuting at the Rumble. Yes, and the women's, correct. I'm excited. I would have thought it would have been Jade versus Charlotte at Mania, but I don't think that's happening anytime soon. Poor Charlotte flares out for nine months. With a freak accident. And she hardly ever gets hurt, but a freak accident did it. I know, man. It's just, it's something. But we'll have to see. I'm excited. You have me excited for the Rumble. I, I Honestly, like I said, this is one of the ones that I'm, I I always love the Rumble. I think Rumble and Survivor Series are my two favorites. Mm-hmm. Um, Just because you, you, you never know. You never know who's going to show up. And I don't know. I'm just looking for something exciting. Well, we will talk about that. Maybe Curtis Axel will finally, you know, get to finish the longest Royal Rumble match of all time. Never got eliminated. Never even entered. Never got nope. in there. Nope. Well, we'll talk more about the Rumble and our thoughts on that in the next episode because it is a Royal Rumble-themed episode, folks, because in Season 1, we talked about Brock and Hardcore Holly, but now this time, not only will we we'll discuss the Rumble in itself, but we were going to talk about uh, – a certain matchup that happened the year prior at Royal Rumble of three. Daniel and I are going to watch it back and we're going to talk about it. Triple H versus Scott Steiner. He really hates me, folks. He, he world, hates me. For the World Heavyweight Championship 21 years later. That's what we're going to talk about. And then we're going to get into something that you like in episode four when we get there. But see, I'm not that mean because we're going to be talking. We both talk all this stuff and it kind of varies on what we you like to torture me. I don't. But I mean, it does. It talks about the Rumble and I just want to get your. Rumble. Yes. You hate me. I love you. Don't don't say that. That's not nice. Don't tell the people that I hate you. You just like torturing me. Uh, um, <laughs> so that'll be the next episode. And Daniel, um, if you've not subscribed to us, click the button. Click the button. I'm Larkin92. Come on. Why, why aren't you doing it yet? Why aren't you doing it? Give us a like. Give us some comment. Give us some feedback. You know, we're two wrestling guys that love talking about wrestling and different topics and just going all over the place for you fans and just doing the damn thing. Check us out doing our thing. SM Show 1, MCL 92, Larkin underscore 92, I'm Larkin MB, LFC, Laundry Fighting Championships. You know the deal. Uh, Daniel over here, D. Crimmins, one on the Instagram, and check him out and follow him. Now, Daniel, you want to promote also as well. You got a little thing thing going with the TSK. That and more important. No offense to the Behind me, you see a nice little, little, little logo here. Yeah, the Pile Driver Pundit, Daniel. You've been doing your thing. I've been really impressed. I've been loving what you're doing. Yeah, got a got a new logo for good good brother mine made it. Loving it. Give me a follow. Help me out. Help grow the brand. As uh Pat McBee would say, for the brand. Amen to that. Subscribe to Daniel on YouTube, the Pile Driver Pundit. He has his first two episodes up, the badass logo. Yeah, we and got more coming. More oh, coming down the pike. I cannot so wait. We got one coming soon. Maybe I'll talk about some Charlotte Flair injury. Maybe some SmackDown spoilers, which are, you know, were taped last week. You never know. I'm looking forward to it, man. I'm looking forward to seeing you getting your grind and expanding. This is why I love you, my brother. And uh, the boys, real quickly, anything TSK-wise that you like to promote? I know you guys did We're trying to, you know, it's schedules, my dude. Schedules. Okay. Well, go back and watch the previous episodes on the Max Wrestling YouTube. Links will be in the description. And... This is where we close it, man. This is where we say goodbye. So long, farewell, la vida, zema, adieu. Uh, check out more subscribe episodes. Subscribe and click that bell. Click the bell, subscribe, and check out more Uncaged for Daniel Crimmins. My name is Mike Larkin. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, everybody. Selfie animals. And a Happy New Year, too. We'll see you in 2024, everybody.